support to support science. And Chad is leading the glider program to support many research projects. <coughs> and we are we're gonna hear what uh, Chad and his team have been uh, have been doing recently. Okay, so I'm kind of a fluff talk. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't, I'm sorry I didn't sit in on Boris's, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a lot less math than, <laughs> than Boris presented and, and, and Brad too. So, um, you know, I'm at, at, at CUT, I've been here two decades and uh, done a lot of different things. So I'm just going to touch on a handful of things that I've done. But uh, the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll probably do is, uh, first thing I'll do is go through a little bit of the COT itself, you know, and what we provide, and some things that students may want to keep in the back of their minds as they do their research, and also the researchers here, just to remind folks uh, some of the infra infrastructure and capabilities we do. But then I'll go through a handful of examples of some of the projects that, that I've been involved in and other engineers have been involved in, the underwater mass spec, the geodetic buoy in, in concert with um, the Department of Geology over in the Tampa campus, uh, an extensive habitat mapping project that we've been doing here uh, in the college for the last four years, and then, as, as Sean Min mentioned, our, our glider program that we've been doing for the last decade. Um, real quick, the COT was started in 95. The idea of having engineers working hand in hand to help scientists potentially create and, and run instrumentation or, or systems and, and whatnot. Um, it's been a group that has started out as nine, went up to as, mon as many as 90-ish, and now we're back down to a much smaller group. Um, a lot of the people transitioned to SRI in 2007. And uh, the, the, those of us that stayed behind, uh, Randy Russell and a, and a few others, and, and Alex Silverman has joined since then, and Steve Butcher, um, are primarily more focused on engineering uh, for oceanography, as opposed to a lot of the groups that went over were a little bit more defense-related applications. Um, not all of them, because one of them you'll hear about is Dr. Tim Short's uh, underwater mass spec. Um, it it, it kind of transitioned uh, along both lines. Um, but the thing I want to highlight on is the capabilities and things that we can provide. You know, we can make pressure vessels and cabling and circuit boards, and we can debug those things. We can fix those things if you need them. We have a plethora of instrumentation. CTDs, dissolved oxygen sensors, fluorometers. Um, we can do pressure testing. We can do oscilloscope testing. We can do all those things. And so if you run into those kinds of issues where you think you may need some help, just give one of us a call and we will try to help as best we can, okay? Going from there, um, some examples of the things that we've done. I'll start off with, with Dr. Short's uh, project. That was one of the first projects I worked on here. Uh, the underwater mass spec, and despite what Woods Hole may say, I think ours was the first in the water, um, is with uh, Dr. Short, uh, David Fries, and Dr. Byrne, and a lot of other people. I've probably forgotten a few people, but um, it became very good at getting light uh, hydrocarbon measurements, and we did testing both just in tanks, but also on an AUV. Uh, and eventually it progressed to the point of being able to do plume tracking and things of that nature. Um, and it's still in use today at, over at SRI, at least a variant thereof. It's, you know, they've, they've made tons of, of improvements since we worked on them here in the late 90s. The geodetic buoy with um, Dr. Tim Dixon over at the Department of Geology. It is a spar buoy. It's just a little different than the buoys you see over here on the seawall. You know, those are usually attached by a cable to the seafloor. This is a spar buoy, so it sits very hard on the bottom with a 40,000 pound anchor and a nice big shackle. 
It was built here in the shop by uh, Jim Mullen and Guy Grant, um, based on a collaboration with uh, some folks over in Italy that designed a larger version of it. But uh, once you have that huge anchor and then you attach a float, that's about 8,000 pounds of, of lift, 40,000 pounds of weight, it sits like this all the time. And that moves a little bit. And so, but what we can do is once we get it in the water and deploy it, and where we chose to deploy it was in uh, Egmont Channel, right by uh, Egmont Key. So there's a high current velocity there. Uh, so it's kind of a challenging location to put it, but uh, it was the right depth for, for, for where we wanted to test it. But it gives us really, really interesting data sets to <laughs> compare, because what we want to find out is, does the bottom move, right? And so this is some of the preliminary data um, from Sierra Z. He's uh, Dr. Dixon's student. But we can see, you know, at the top, it's moving around from current and winds. But then you resolve, this is the same scale, you can resolve down to the fact that the bottom really is not moving. Okay, that's a decimeter, maybe, of error. So it's staying in the same place. The other thing is, once we put it in, you would assume something 40,000 pounds is going to sink a little bit. And it did for a while, but then it's kind of sat there and been in the same location and stayed um, quite well. And so the, the next step is to move that someplace else where it might be more interesting. You know, we picked some place like Egmont Key because um, it's a stable place that doesn't move. We want to put it some, uh, Dr. Dixon wants to put it someplace where there might be uplift from volcanoes or subsidence and other things. So it's, uh, it's been a fun project. Next project I'm going to talk about is the uh, Sea Scamp. And um, the highlight here is the team that was built by Dr. Murawski and us. Um, it's a great team of, of really good people. We've had a, a lot of fun on this project. Um, with oversight from, from others not in the picture, like Dr. Locker, uh, FWRI, Nextdoor, NOAA, uh, the funding agency NIFWIF, SRI, uh, University of New Hampshire, and some of the other NOAA organizations. And so what, how do we approach habitat mapping? And the objective is, think about it in terms of, you know, if you look at Google Earth, Every single person in here can look at Google Earth and see the green areas are where the bears live and the gray areas are where the people live, etc. We don't have those maps for under the water very much, especially not in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And so the way we approach that is that we take multi-beam sonar, attach it to the boat, and we drive around in a lawnmower pattern and create maps at the bottom that look really pretty like this. And you, know, you can see there's a, a ridge there, right? And that's probably rock. And maybe this is sand over here, right? Well, to make sure of that, we tow a video system that we developed at COT called the Seabass. It's got six vi video cameras and CTD, fluorometer, a bunch of other sensors that all synchronize the data. and and uh, catalog, catalog it in a SQL database. And we drag it along the bottom at about 10 feet off the bottom for, at about four knots and do that for 10 to 20 hours a day, creating lots and lots of video that has to be watched. And at the same time of looking at the bottom to ascertain what that bottom is, to understand a map of what that bottom might be and make sure that that is rock versus sand. We also get to count fish or turtles or other things, right? And at the same time we're doing that, we get water column sonar from the boat through an EK80 uh, or, or EK60 SIMRAD sonar system that can get calibrated water column biomass, right? And so what do we do with all those data sets? So over the last four years, we had 21 cruises. Um, We've mapped 2,400 kilometers of, of bottom and created 
plus minutes of or hours of video over that time. And with that data, you can start doing things, first of all, on a geological side. Um, Dr. Locker is looking at, and others are looking at, okay, so you start seeing these patterns of the things that we've mapped and comparing it all along the shoreline. Part of what we're trying to do is figure out where fishy neighborhoods are, right? So can we look at what little data we have? This is everything that we know of that's been mapped on the West Florida shelf. You start looking, you know, these, the, this is just bathymetry lines provided by NOAA. You know, you start seeing patterns, can you ascertain from these patterns where other fishy neighborhoods might be? And so we're trying to use the data in that direction Oops. In addition to that, in addition to just seeing fish, we also get to see turtles in ways that are not generally seen. Most turtle research is done with turtles that come to shore and go offshore and back and forth. We see the, them while we're flying the sea bass anytime that, that, that we happen to see them. We've been a little surprised that the vast majority that we've seen have been right on the natural gas pipeline as opposed to in natural environments. But in addition to just seeing them, we get to see what they're doing, what are they foraging on, what might they be eating, how big are they, what's their sex, exactly, et cetera. Um, but then uh, one of the bigger parts is comparing the video to the sonar. So the water column sonar. So we uh, collect the video information and it's, it's not just seeing the fish, it's measuring the fish because they are stereo video cameras so we can actually get biomass estimates from the video. And so we compare that biomass to the biomass that we're getting from the sonar and this is the work of, of, of Sarah and Ed especially. Um, and ascertaining other patterns and biases between that because they don't line up exactly and why not? In areas that are more rugose, we're getting more on the video and less on the acoustics because the acoustics can't pick out the things in real rugose areas that are, that where the bottom is really rough. Um, but eventually comparing these two data sets will create bio bias um, statistics that could be used so that you could use whichever one is more cost effective down the down the road for different environments would be our thought you know by comparing those two technologies in a statistical way um, you can you can learn which is more cost effective and better for various areas probably oh and uh, there is a video if I can get it to go just to demonstrate it a little bit more what I'm talking about that comparison because the uh, the video is a little bit behind the boat because the, the, the sonar is on the boat. So this is the sonar and this is the video. We have forward looking and two side cameras. Um, the sea bass tow body is this brown line and this white line. So the sea bass is right there. And so this is what the sonar is seeing as the boat passes over it. And then you can start seeing, oh, we're going to get ready to come over a, a, a ridge here. And you can start seeing the ridge. And then what is all this stuff? Okay, so we know it's fish, but we don't have no idea what it is. Then you start using the video to say, oh, that's a bunch of gray snapper? Gray snapper. <laughs> so. Comparing those kinds, of, again, comparing those two technologies gives you insight into what each is good at doing. So part of the end game of this, of this project is though to, ask, to create habitat maps, right? So we create these bottom maps of bathymetry, but we wanna know what is what, because we're towing this video over it, okay? and so. That same, video, that same image that I showed you that was kind of 3D of the, the ridge, that's this same thing right here. It's called the elbow. It's about 90 miles offshore. And the brown is estimated to be sand, mostly. The red is mostly estimated to be rock or reef, hard bottom. And then you start comparing, okay, so we got a map of that now based on the video 
and the sonar data. And then we do fish counts for various types of fish. Where are the fish hanging out? The fish are hanging out in the red areas. They're hanging out on the rocks. That's what fish do, right? The vast majority of them, except for sand tile fish. But then you can start extrapolating that. The, you know, the, red air, the reds are this amount of area. The, the, the brown is this amount of area. And you start getting statistics of that. This is all Alex Illich's uh, thesis work. And um, I encourage you to talk to him if, if, if you have any questions. Uh, last slide I'm going to show about it is, you know, we are not doing this, you know, as a technology group, we are not doing this completely on our own. We are sharing the information with others, and now NOAA has started using our code and our tow body information to create their own systems that are very similar. So hopefully we're extrapolating this up to help management decisions. All right, the last subject I'm going to get into is our glider feet. Uh, there's a huge list of people there because it running robots in the ocean for a month or two at a time is a lot of work and it's hard and um, so there's a lot of people there that have helped us there's a lot of people that have funded us and it's a really fun project or, or branch of the things that I do um, to be clear, um, underwater gliders uh, are different than, than some other things that call themselves gliders. They just uh, understand how they work. They float and sink between the surface and the bottom. Okay, so they measure, they were, they were funded by the Navy to uh, three different groups to design them at Scripps, University of Washington, Applied Physics Lab, and MIT slash Web Research. And as in the most efficient way to try to collect subsurface data from the surface to the bottom or to a depth limitation, right? So um, those groups actually collaborated more than they competed, and the, the vehicles they created are more similar than they are different. But in general, what they do is they float and sink over and over and over again, like an Argos float using buoyancy, but instead of just floating up and down, they tilt. They move some mass forward or move it back, and they tilt, and they have wings, and so they soar. And so what you're seeing here, like this is temperature up at the top. That's a week's worth of data going from the shelf break to 30 meters of water, going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down for a week, 100 times a day or however often. And uh, every three hours or so, it surfaces and transmits that data back. And they're wonderful tools. You know, they, they work. They work for several weeks to a month or several months at a time, uh, sending that data back. And as I mentioned, they were created primarily for, for, by the Navy for physics to understand the, the density structure, because the Navy cares about sound propagation. Okay, so, and they wanted a cheap way to get sound propagation. Once it's a pickup truck and it works, you can do all kinds of other stuff with it. And so what we've been doing, Bob talked a lot this morning about red tide prediction, and it's, it's been quite helpful in that, you know, in, in that understanding where, not only where the water is moving, but what might be in the water and what we might want to go out and, s and sample to ascertain where something like red tide might be at that time. You know, taking the satellite imagery that, that Charmin does and take it from the surface down to the bottom. You know, I extrapolating that. Obviously, understanding the circulation dy dynamics, uh, oil transport. Uh, but we've moved in the last couple of years a little bit more into trying to count and track fish and do water column biomass, kind of similar to the, the other project that I mentioned. And recently, we've gotten some funding to try to help uh, hurricane prediction in understanding where heat content is in uh, at various areas in front of a hurricane. So circulation understanding is pretty under is, is, is pretty straightforward. You know, you, you know, <coughs> HICOM uses surface altimetry and a lot of other things, but having that that third dimension uh, without that third dimension, you're just kind of guessing and the models are really not in all, all modelers will tell you that the models are no good without without that third dimension and and full ground truthing 
Um, and I'm not going to go through this too much, uh, as Bob went through it this morning, but, and Sean Min, this is some work that Bob and Sean Min have, have done over the years. You know, the one thing that, that, that does stick out is, okay, so these are a series of, of satellite images from Sean Min that show the, the yellow line is the glider, and these lines represent various images here. So as soon as it gets into this area that his group had said is surface red tide, the water column got completely mixed. Prior to that, there was this layer along the bottom the entire time that we were, that the glider was out here and out here. And so this is part of what Bob has been, been stressing and uh, trying to help understand of uh, is that bottom layer red tide and, and can we prove that it is? And I think in general, he, he, he's done a pretty good job with that. Um, during the red tide, uh, I mean, the, the oil spill, uh, ourselves and a bunch of other groups put gliders out as, as within less than a month. Um, and with that information as combined with Dr. Murawski's work and Dr. Paul's work, I think it was, it was stated pretty emphatically that, that, that uh, oil contaminated waters did make it up onto the West Florida Shelf, but that was in no small part uh, due to the uh, understanding provided by, by some of the data that, that ourselves and other groups collected. Um, moving on a little bit to what I have been pushing the last several years is trying to count fish. Uh, we've done a lot in three different ways. Uh, the first is acoustic, acoustic telemetry, tagging fish. Uh, one study we tagged 61 fish along the natural gas pipeline about uh, 80 miles offshore <coughs> and at the same time we put moorings to listen as well as flying the glider through the region seasonally and we caught uh, the gliders did not do as good as, as the moorings but the glider the moorings were there all the time the moorings I mean the gliders were there less than 1% of the time so we still caught 70% of the same fish that hung out there for over a year. Uh, similarly, we've been doing it for a long time with, with former uh, researcher here at USF, Dr. David Mann and Carrie Wall, um, passive acoustics, uh, listening for fish sounds. Uh, that got most famously reported in the paper as fish farts, <laughs> but um, it was, it's more useful as red grouper sounds. And what you get with this and, and the next slide is you start getting maps of where the fish are. And um, that's a little interesting. I don't have a slide on it, but I'll get to that in a second. But um, it, it gives you ideas and gives you see seasonal patterns of where fish may be or may not be. Uh, and the last thing we've been doing is the water column echo sounders. Um, We've got two of them now, uh, one a Canadian uh, entity, ASL Environmental, AZFP, and now we just last month went out and tested our brand new SIMRAD EK60, and Dr. Taylor is showing our first, first successful um, echo sounding profiles from the glider. Um, it was, uh, a uh, we, we got the, echo sounder on Tuesday. We sailed on Saturday or Sunday. We got the successful results on Monday and then we didn't get the, we got the glider talking to the echo sounder on our way back in on Wednesday, but we got it working. And so now we have two different ones. We will absolutely positively be doing comparisons whether the manufacturers like that or not. But you get you know, what you really want, <clears throat> and the same thing with the habitat mapping project, is you start getting biomass hotspots. Okay, so why are fish hanging out here and here? Well, here, they're right on the pipeline. Why are they over here, off the pipeline? And I should have created a, a slide on this, but we actually did that comparing um, 
the biomass on the the gliders to the biomass we were getting or the sounds that we're getting from the passive acoustics where both of them were real hot in one area on during one glider transect and we went back there on one of our sea scamp cruises on our way in and mapped it real quick and it turns out there's a two meter ridge of hard bottom that we had no idea was there and so the idea with gliders is you know, the, the person who does it the best in the world is Dan Rudnick at Scripps, and he has at least five gliders in the water at all times, 24-7, 365, just off the southern coast of California, much less all the other places he does it. And so you have these time series of seeing things, and sometimes you don't know what you're going to see. You know, you start doing this all the time. You know, whether it's chlorophyll, whether it's fish biomass, whether it's fish sounds, you'll start seeing patterns. Do they leave when, the, when maybe a red tide comes through? Do they not? Do, you, do they go offshore? Do they go inshore? You know, th things of that nature. And so that's, that's my spiel. Um, the last few things I'm going to say to the students, um, I have been castigated for my writing styles in papers and whatnot because I am perceived as far too casual. But I think if you're not speaking to the people that are funding and paying your taxes to do this in a way that they can understand, you leave yourself to be at best misinterpreted interpreted, or maybe even misrepresented. And I think you have to be blunt in the things you say. And so I urge you all to, to be blunt and clear in the things you say. And don't, as you go forward, don't always worry about how fast other people are progressing compared to you. I had a guy who worked for me that left in 2005 making more than I made until a couple years ago. But I'm pretty happy with the decisions I've made, and I enjoy myself here. I'm still friends with him. He's, very, he's a great guy. <laughs> um, and don't ever stop trying to learn. You know, just keep trying something new. You know. The last thing is um, take guidance from anybody. It doesn't. The and I, and I talk about this often in engineering. The best ideas almost always come up after two thirds of the way through the project. You know, you're talking about it and then all of a sudden you're having dinner with a lawyer or a guy who works at the boatyard and they say, why didn't you just do this? Yeah, <laughs> I wish I would have now that you mentioned it. You know, and the best person in my life who always did that was my, my best friend, John. He was a hell of a fisherman and a writer and uh, a great friend, and he provided me all the guidance I've I, I needed for the last for the my first forty years, forty five years. <laughs> that's that's all I got. Sorry if I went over.